Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And I know that uh, summer is upon us, and we all have things we hope to accomplish this summer. It may be a time of rest and restoration. It may be a time of increased opportunity out in the community. It may be a time of visiting with family and friends that we haven't seen in a while, but whatever it is, we pray that God might lead us and direct us in it. Today, if you are entering summer with no hope or no plans or no, uh, then believe today that as the service unfolds, that God is going to speak to you that you might have his vision for your life this summer. That you might say, you know what, I'm going to go down and take lots of pictures at the waterfront. Or I'm going to uh, start out on that ed exercise program that God has been speaking to me about. Or I'm going to begin to spend more time out in the community because the weather is nicer so that I might be used of God to speak in the lives of people. At the beginning of the service, there was a scripture up on the uh, screen. It was from Isaiah 40. And it was in particular verses 4 and 5. And it said, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And sometimes as we're expecting God to do things, or we're praying that God will do things, we say, I'm the only one who sees it. Nobody else around me seems to see it. And here it says that God wants to do a work that all flesh shall see it together. Isn't that exciting? Now as we come to gather on Sunday or Wednesdays or whenever you gather, you might find that you find it's easy to expect God to meet you in those times. And you might find that in the rest of your life, not so much. And that might be part of your challenge that you might find. You might be one of those people who, as long as I'm with other Christians or there's other people to encourage me, I'm able to walk with God. But when I get home alone, it all seems to slide away kind of like, like sand through your fingers. It's, I try to hang on to it, but it just drains between my fingers. It's interesting that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writing to Timothy says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. First Timothy 6, 6 and 7. And the reason I bring that up is because often we live our life and we are surrounded by people. We may not have people living with us right next to us, but we are surrounded by people. And so much of our life is spent in a world where there are people. So much of our church experience is spent in a place where there are other people. And I know from my own past experiences, it's sometimes easy to rely on the crowd mentality to get us through. We've been talking about how as a person, and we're subjected to the body of Christ, other people speak into our life and they bring encouragement, and hopefully we're reciprocating by speaking words of encouragement or correction or challenge or excitement back and forth so that we are built up by each other. That's the purpose for the body, for the edification of the saints for the work of the ministry. But the reality is that there are two things that are going to happen to us where in the natural we are all alone. Yes, I know there were people in the room when you were born, but you had to do the actual being born part on your own. Even as a twin, if you were a twin, one went out and the other followed, right? You might have been the first twin leading the way, or the second twin or triplet following on, but you have to do that alone. And the second thing is that we all die alone. There may be people in the room with us as we die, but we die alone. And the reason I'm saying that is because it's important for us to understand that our walk with God is not based on how many Christian people we have hanging around with us. It's great to have Christian friends. It's great to have people speak the Word of God to us. It's great to gather to worship God together. But the reality is that God wants to do an amazing thing in us because He wants us to experience His presence for ourselves personally. Now, if you've been reading through the Old Testament at all, you know that in the Old Testament, God met with them in the holy place. Right? The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would go in there alone and he only could go in there with sacrifices to offer for the sins of the people. And we've talked about how he had bells on him and a, a, and a, 
rope tied to his ankle. The bells would let people know he was still alive and moving in there, right? And the rope was so if he stopped moving in there, they could drag him out dead. If God was unpleased or displeased with the sacrifice of the sins of the people. We know that down through time we've seen many manifestations of the power of God, right? We've seen how the earth has swallowed up people in the times of Moses and in the Old Testament. We've seen how the judgment of God has come upon people. We know even in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira were struck down by the power of God for lying up to the Holy Ghost. And yet we read this. As we started our service, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see together. The presence of God. In Genesis 3, we have that great account that begins this whole journey. In Genesis 3, just verse 8, I'm, I'm reading, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden and in the cool of the day. God came and dwelt in the actual presence of Adam and Eve. Right? That's where it all started. That's the desire that God has for us. So the question you have to ask yourself is, how can I experience God's presence? Now we know that that with God, everything is by faith. It's by faith that we experience the presence of God. But that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a manifestation of the presence of God, right? Psalm 100 is one of those psalms we used to sing in, in the service. And one of the one of the one of the verses in Psalm 100 is verse two, and it says, "Serve the Lord with gladness and come before His presence with singing." We don't just do this because it's something that makes us feel good, but we actually come into the presence of God as we sing songs of praise to His name. Psalm 95, 2 says, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with songs. That great benediction in Jude, Jude 1, 24 says, 24 says, Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. As we endeavor to grow in God, as we endeavor to have a sincere walk with God, God wants to make His presence real. Many of you have gone out and bought books about, devotional books about how to get into the presence of God or how to make your devotional time more real. And, and the reality is no matter how many books you buy or how many other principles you put in practice, until you begin to experience God's presence, it will never really be a true devotional time in the presence of God. Right? And what is it that keeps us from coming into God's presence? Go ahead, offer up all your answers. That's great. Internet. <laughs> Television. Song. Me. Tiredness. Me. Right? Sin consciousness. <clears throat> you feel guilty about something that's going on in your life, but you can't let it go, and you don't want to let it go, so you don't want to come into God's presence because you know that God wants me to let this go, and I just can't be real with God because I know it's not right. Too. Unworthiness? Yeah. And so as we embark on this journey together, and we've begun hopefully the journey, it's not something new to any of us, but as we embark on that journey farther on that, that road, we have to begin to say, you know what? If my time with God isn't working, why isn't it working? Why am I not experiencing the presence of God in my life? 
when we talked last week a little bit about uh, the test. Remember the test? How many people remember what the test was? No, yes. We can tell where our relationship with God is, the condition of our heart by... Right. That's right. So if we want to know the condition of our heart, if we want to know where we are with God, all we have to do is this week take a notepad and write out of our, down the things that are coming out of our mouth. Right? Do it. Do it just as an exercise for yourself to find out where you are. What are the things that I'm talking about? What are the things that I'm emphasizing? What are the things that I'm sharing with people? What are the things that I'm saying? Take a look. Is my life just a whole series of complaints? Is my life a whole series of negative things? Or do, do things come out of my mouth that are edifying to others and glorifying to God? Right? You see, we, we want it to be this formula thing that we do in a set time where we can control it, and then we want that to work out our whole life. And what God wants us to do is to walk in His presence. Right? As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Abide in me, and I abide in you, or my words abide in you. You shall have, you shall ask what you want, you shall have, right? But that's what the Bible says. That's coming out of that relationship with God. It's not coming out of some selfish, um, superficial relationship with God that's based on some prayer you said 30 years ago. We want the power and presence of God. It's, it's something that, that we have to create an opportunity for it to happen. We have to exercise being led by the Spirit of God. In 1 Chronicles 16, two verses. 1 Chronicles 16, 20, verses 26 and 27. I'll read this. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in His presence. Strength and gladness are in His place. Did you get that? Glory and honor are in His presence. You see, we, we can never hope to be set free. We can never hope to overcome the flesh. We can never hope to be transformed into His image if we're never in His presence. Right? Remember as Moses went up to the mountaintop to meet with God? Remember? Moses went up on the mountaintop to meet with God, and God is so holy he couldn't be allowed to see all of God because no man can see God and live. Right? God says, well, Moses, I allow you to see my hinder parts. As I move by, I allow you to see a glimpse of who I am. Wasn't that great? I can't imagine what that was like. But yet I can. And remember that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. On tablets of stone. Phenomenal. And remember when Moses came down from the mountaintop and it said that his face shone and it was so bright that he had to wear a veil because the people couldn't stand it. Just from being in God's presence. You see, that's what walking with God is about. We walk, we walk out every day the existence that we have in God from being in His presence. Every day it talks about as Jesus walked on this earth that he would go out and he would spend time alone with the Father in prayer and seeking his faith and communing with God. And so we go through these dry experiences of meeting with God. And when they're really dry, we cut them down from an hour to four minutes. Right? I'm not getting anything out of this, so I'll just do a quick four minute reading and then I'm off to sleep or I'm off to work. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. That's what God wants to do, right? 
He wants to do it in your life. He wants to do it in your community. He wants to do it in this world. He wants to do it wherever the soles of our feet tread. But the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's a prophetic utterance, right? God spoke it. Everything God speaks comes to pass. Then it goes on and it says, The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass, the grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So you open that book as you're home alone and you say, God, where is the God of Elijah? Right? Right? Don't you say things like that to God? God, you who have been from the beginning, you who have down through time demonstrated yourself in miraculous and powerful things, you who sent Jesus into the world, the Son of God, to die for the sins of the world and to be resurrected in newness of life and who has promised life and hope and power and anointing and gifts and callings and peace. It's to you that I cry out, right? And as I read your word, God, help it to come alive in me that I don't try to change it to be like me, but I allow it to change me to be like you. And you begin to open it. You begin to read it. You begin to meditate on it. And you begin to see the challenges in your life as an opportunity to live up the glory of God, right? Do you see that? That every challenge that has come into your life is an opportunity to demonstrate the same sonship that Jesus demonstrated in the garden when He said, Not my will, but thy will be done. Right? And you look at it and you say, This is not what I would like to do. But praise God, it's what I get to do for the glory of God. Right? And you go out into the world and you demonstrate the character of God. Summer is here. We talked about the times. We talked about seasons. Times change. The seasons move on. And to every season there is a purpose. Right? And to every life there is a purpose. To serve the Lord with gladness. Just a moment I'm going to pray with us. Thank God over the summer would begin to make real in all of us those things that we've been praying, studying, seeking after. That God is going to do the work in us that is needful that we might continue to be what we really want to be in Him. And I don't mean that that's a selfish prayer. I mean to be what we want to be, which is to be like Him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. First Epistle of John, not the Gospel of John. First John 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It's so typical of what we're talking about. That by faith we are the children of God. We, we embrace that by faith. We believe it because the Word of God says that whosoever shall put their trust in the Lord shall be saved. Right? That whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That we've been adopted into God's family through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice that He paid. So, beloved, now we are the children of God, all of us. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. It might be your life. You might say, God, I'm a child, but I just don't know what I shall be. You know, I was talking to somebody not too long ago about, you know, what did you want to be when they grow up? And I said, they said, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. 50-year-olds that don't know what we want to be when we grow up. And that's true for us in some ways. But
But we know that we are the children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And so sometime between now and eternity, God is going to continue that transformational work in my life, that I will be like Him. And it will be perfected when I enter His presence and I see Him as He is. <clears throat> That's exciting. And now we are here. And we're almost out of time. In Ephesians 5 we read this. Starting at verse 17 of Ephesians 5. Wherefore be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Anybody here sometimes feel like they're unwise? Well, you know what the answer to that is? Is knowing what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We talk about being filled with the Spirit. You know, somebody says, oh, I was filled with the Spirit oh, way back in the 70s during the Jesus movement. Well, what's happened to you since then? I would think. Yeah. Every Sunday I come up here, they give me either a glass of water or a bottle of water or something, right? And uh, they usually start off full, right? But I'm going to drink some of it. And now it's not quite so full, right? And every time we live in our life and as we go out and live, we use that power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible really means for us to be continually filled. If I were to take this bottle and stick it under the tap in the kitchen there, and run the water, what would happen to it? What else would happen to it? It would overflow. Right. And as long as it was being filled, water would go in and the water would fill and it would flow out. And there shall be what? Rivers of living water flowing out from our belly. And so we need to be continually filled with the power of God. Speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Did you do, do you do maintenance on your, anybody here who has a car, do you do any maintenance on that car? You have a house, do you do any maintenance on that house? Right? You have a guitar, do you do any maintenance on it? Everything requires maintenance. Right? And, and we're the same. And if we're going to continue to give out into the kingdom of God, just as Jesus did, he said, as he, as he touched the woman with the issue of blood, he said he felt virtue go out of him. He felt the power of God go out of him. And he was continually being filled by the power of God that he might have to give. The principle in the Bible is in all areas are like that, that the reason we want God's financial blessing is that we might have to give. Those things go together. We receive and we give. We receive and we give. And we, they go together, giving and receiving, sowing and reaping. The kingdom of God is the same. That as we share and extend, and God pours into us. God extends His love towards us. The, shed of, uh, the, the, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart, it says in Romans. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord is part of your spiritual maintenance and you come home and you're beat up and you're and you're depressed and you're full of anxiety and all the stuff that comes from living in this world and you get into the presence of God and you sing songs of praise and worship unto God and you become renewed in his presence and if we aren't being renewed in his presence we are being drained out of his presence it has nothing to do with does God love us God always loves us it has nothing to do with God abandoning us. God will never abandon us. It has to do with what we must do to stay in His presence. 
speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.